And a very warm welcome to COVID-19 Updates from Singapore. My name is Caitlin Wee and I'm a third year medical student at NUS Yong Lu Lin School of Medicine. This is a series of webinars presented by NUS Yong Lu Lin School of Medicine, National University Health System and Global Outbreak Alert and Response Network. The COVID-19 Updates from Singapore weekly webinar series will provide viewpoints and insights from a panel of leading experts in infectious diseases and related specialties and disciplines. It is now my honour to introduce you to our moderator, who is also the programme director of this series. Recruited to establish an infectious disease training programme in Singapore, he was the first infectious diseases head of department in the Communicable Disease Centre here in 1992. He is currently Associate Vice President for Health Innovation and Transformation, National University of Singapore. Ladies and gentlemen, Associate Professor David Allen. Thank you, Caitlin. Good evening and welcome to our 14th uh, installment of our webinar, uh, COVID-19 Updates from Singapore. Your interest in COVID-19 is appreciated, as is your support of our efforts to share what we know with you. We hope this broadcast continues to find you and your loved ones safe and well. Uh, we'll return to our customary format this week. Uh, each episode includes a review of regional and international epidemiology by Dale Fisher, followed by in-depth talk by our visiting guest expert. This week, it is Dr. Cornelia Chi. Then we'll have a question and uh, answer period with our guest expert, uh, followed by update of current events by Dale, and then close with a preview of next week's guest expert and the reveal of the mystery pandemic song of the week. Uh, please send in your questions using the Q&A tab at the bottom of your uh, toolbox, uh, along with your country of origin. Uh, we do welcome your comments and we strive to get better. It gives me great pleasure to introduce uh, Dale Fisher, who is Professor of Medicine at National University of Singapore, Yang Lu Lin School of Medicine, Senior Consultant Division of Infectious Diseases at National University Hospital, and Chair of the Global Outbreak Alert and Response Network, hosted by World Health Organization. Dale, over to you. Thanks, David. Okay. Um, hi, everyone, again. Uh, 14 weeks. Seems, uh, seems like we've been doing this a few months. Um, so I'll, I'll start with my usual slide, the Johns Hopkins University uh, uh, um, graphic. Uh, you can see now that the, the numbers are, are, are going faster. Um, 1.3 million cases over the last week, uh, fairly flat in the deaths at around 33,000. 
the main drivers of this remain uh, US, Brazil, India's overtaken Russia. Um, and uh, likewise, most of the deaths are, are US and Brazil at this stage. Uh, this is the global epi curve. You can see the major contribution in, in orange, which is the, the Americas. So that includes um, uh, the US and Brazil driving most of that. Um, the green one, the Southeast Asian region contains India. And, and the one you can hardly see down the bottom is the brown one, which is the Western Pacific area, which is, which is where we are. Um, and, and you can see there that what, what we've got is around 200,000 uh, cases a day now. Uh, so that gets you up to your 1.3, 1.4 million a week. Uh, deaths are around 5,000 uh, per day. So here's just the, the five-day moving average of the three main countries. And you can see, as I've shown in previous weeks, that uh, the US have done this extraordinary turnaround with 30,000 cases a day coming down to 20,000 and now up to 50,000. And some of these days are, are actually 60,000. Brazil um, may be plateauing off in, in terms of its cases. Um, I'm not sure. Uh, uh, I uh, think school's probably still out on that one. But in India is, is fairly, fairly relentless. Um, this is the epi curves by region. Um, and particularly, you can see Africa is having about 15,000 cases a day with a relatively low death rate. Um, the Americas still going up with, with, with their death rate there of two or 3,000 per day. Uh, Eastern Mediterranean seems to have flattened off. Europe is a, is a, a story of many different countries, obviously, and, uh, and, and this uh, is being maintained now really by, by Eastern Europe, if you like, and uh, as Western Europe has, has come down. So this is being maintained by, by, by other countries. Um, Southeast Asia, this was the Indian catch-up uh, in, in death reporting. Uh, this was the China catch-up on death reporting. So in, in the Western Pacific region, we're running at uh, very, very few deaths um, and, uh, and cases in the sort of uh, 2,000, 3,000. I'm not going to go through every country this week. I'm just trying to make it a slightly shorter session in, just for the, for the scheduling reasons. Um, the, the big talk of the town is, uh, is Australia, of course. Um, they've been coming out of lockdown for, for, for a couple of months now. Uh, never really quite, quite got fully back to normal before this, this spike. And this is, uh, this is all happening in Melbourne. So Australia's had about 9,000 cases altogether. There's, uh, there's 106 deaths. Um, there's about 160 to 190 cases a day in Victoria. Um, and, and this is what's prompted, uh, prompted a, a, a re-lockdown, but it's a fairly focused one in Melbourne with particular attention to some tower blocks um, of uh, l largely migrant, uh, underprivileged uh, people. So it, it's, a, it's quite similar to a, to a dormitory situation, I think. Uh, obviously, there's some particular nuances. This seems to have started when... Um, uh, there was a, a security guard who was working in one of the quarantine hotels, um, became infected, um, and they, or the whole, the whole Melbourne cluster seems related to that. So it really just takes one infection control breach and, and Melbourne's back in lockdown. So it's, uh, it's quite different across the states and they've even for the first time uh, in a hundred years shut the border with New South Wales. Philippines is, is the other story. Um, it's, uh, it's had around 42,000 cases with, with 1,300 deaths. This is probably not so real, this, this coming up. They had a, a testing backlog, so they had a lot of samples for, for some months and, and, and they, they caught up once with their improving testing capacity. So I don't think that's a surge in cases. Um, most of their cases, about half of them are in metropolitan Manila. Um, there's a spike in uh, spike in cases and deaths uh, in Cebu City, uh, and and hospitals describing being being overwhelmed. Uh, there's some slum areas, I think, in in Cebu City, and and, and they're uh, they're really having trouble getting uh, contact tracing and all the conventional outbreak responses happening. They're testing positivity rates 5.7, so that could be a bit 
better as well. Um, Japan, this little spike here is, is, uh, is now up to 200 cases on some days and, and that's, that's related to some uh, nightclub outbreaks in, in, in Tokyo. Uh, Korea just doing this nice little rumble along which I've, uh, I'm, I'm a big fan of. I think this is, this is your perfect epi curve, the Korean one. So India, um, 675,000 cases and, and almost 20,000 deaths in, in total, um, testing positivity rate of 8%. So, um, so uh, th this really is just, just fairly relentless. As I've said before, it's, it's fairly heterogeneous. Some, some places not so badly affected, but, but others have got, uh, have got major problems. There's a, a, a shutdown in, uh, in, in an area of Kerala, um, and as well as that, Mumbai was having problems. Um, so, uh, so, but uh, but actually, it's not all bad news. I, I, I this this came a, I came across this with this uh, place. Uh, it's called the Dharavi slum, and and this whole effort became the the Dharavi um, uh, mission, Mission Dharavi. It was called. Uh, so. Uh, this is an area, and, and hello, to, I know we've got a lot of uh, people from India that, uh, that, that tune into us, so, so hello to all of you, and I hope I've got this story right, but there's about, uh, there's about a million people that live in this area, which is two square miles, um, and they've had all together, you can see this uh, newspaper on June 30th said they had 2,268 cases. Um, in, uh, in April, they had... 490 in in May they had about 1200 so so June was another thousand but but obviously it, it's peaked in 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 early June and look at these cases in in July so so it's absolutely stunning that they could they could control this outbreak in this setting um, and and they did it with good old-fashioned outbreak response they took over schools and halls and sports facilities and, and develop quarantine areas. They were doing about, uh, uh, they did about 12,000 tests in total um, and uh, with, with a mobile testing unit. So, so uh, a good story. I mean, I guess this is still, still uh, dry kindling. So it's, uh, it, it, uh, it could take off again, but uh, nonetheless, it's a, it's a good story. The other area I thought I might just have a look at because we've we've never really spoken about this is uh, is parts of uh, of Eastern Europe and uh, and and this came came across um, Greece is uh, is doing remarkably well right three and a half thousand cases one hundred and ninety two deaths but you can see that they're, they're rumbling along at about maybe twenty cases a day now um, and, and many of those are actually from from Serbia. So you can see uh, Greece here, uh, Serbia not far away, and there's there's been there, there's problems here. You can see there's uh, it's got a, a beautiful second wave shape to it. As soon as they uh, unlocked all the the the, uh, the efforts they had in in May, this uh, resurgence came back. And apparently, this is a, a, a media reports uh, are of a uh, poor case and uh, or underreporting of cases and deaths. So, so Greece has uh, shut the borders to, 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 uh, to, to keep out these areas. You can see the other areas with North Macedonia and Romania, Bulgaria, all, all the curves are really going the wrong way. So, uh, but uh, interestingly with Serbia, it was one of the ones that uh, is, is allowed to go to the EU. You'll remember that the EU has declared 15 countries that can go there. Uh, and UK has also declared countries that are allowed in without uh, the 14 days quarantine. And Serbia is one of those. So, so I think this is uh, something to watch. The Serbian uh, testing positivity rates about five, just over 5%. So um, as I said, I'm not gonna go through all the countries this week. I'm just gonna be a bit more uh, mindful of time, but just to, to make the point that we're seeing a lot more focused lockdowns now. Leicester locked down on June 30. Um, so you can see there, there's London, there's Birmingham. So Leicester's, Leicester's here. So it's right in the middle of the, of the country. And, and they got to, uh, not a lot. I think it was around 500 cases a week they were having. So, uh, so anyway, this, this got locked down. 
um, and you can see we're, we're back to those familiar bare streets. Um, uh, what else? There's also uh, one in Spain. This, uh, and if there's anyone that wants to criticize my pronunciation, go for it. Um, the, the Segria region of Lieda, uh, Lieda. And um, so that, that's, that's over here. And this area, this is uh, La Marina in, in Galicia, which is uh, a, a beach resort. So they've both been locked down. So uh, you get increasing cases. Uh, clearly people are looking to, to have a much smarter shutdown. It'd be better, uh, shutdown shouldn't really be in the playbook, but unfortunately once you get overwhelmed or, or you're heading towards overwhelmed hospitals, overwhelmed public health systems, you can't do the contact tracing anymore, your testing capacity is, is used up, then you've then you really got no choice. So that's, uh, uh, and, and probably earlier is better if you're, if you're seeing the, the trend. Um, this is a focused lockdown, as I say, in Melbourne. These are the, the blocks and there's, there, were, there were about 3,000 people uh, across these blocks that, that were locked down. Now, they've, they've done a lot of testing. Some of them are, are really quite negative, so they've unlocked them and just put them on the Melbourne lockdown. They've got different scales of, of lockdown. So, uh, nonetheless, that's what's happening in Melbourne. And for those of you who don't know, it's right down the, the, uh, the southeastern corner of Australia. Uh, and you can see the they've locked down. I heard someone on the. It's actually all the all the problems are around here, much more inner city. But uh, I'm not sure how they arrived at, at where the borderline would be. But I know this this people uh, the people on this side of the water are, are not as happy as the people on this side of the water who are not on lockdown. Um, and of course, India. And don't even ask me to pronounce that. But anyway, it's in it's in Kerala. They've called this a a, a triple lockdown. And uh, tri triple lockdown, uh, really, it's, it's interesting because there's been some other Indian towns that have had lockdowns uh, and, and they call it this triple one. So, so uh, level one is sort of general containment. It just stops movement of, of all people in the area. So you can see the area here. Um, and uh, so there are, there are checkpoints and there's, there, there's um, uh, closed roads, there's, there might be an area where there's only one road in and one road out and there's barricades and police on, on the other roads. So, so they're really trying to stop total movement. Then there's the uh, movement of the specific, within a specific geographical area. Uh, and those areas might have had cases, they might have contacts, um, they're, they're sort of quarantine zones. So there's an extra special sort of lockdown for those areas. And then lockdown three is, is really at that household level where there might be contacts and there's extra special attention paid to, to those. So it's, a, it's an interesting concept. Um, I, I certainly don't have any problems with it. It's, uh, it's uh, I guess, a, a smart lockdown. Um, so back over to Singapore now. Um, here's our, the three curves I show every week. Um, imported cases remain negligible. Community cases, well, there's a little blip, but we, we, we would have expected that. Uh, you can see it's still around 20 a day um, and the dormitory residents are, are, are slowly making their way down. Uh, linked versus unlinked. So you can see there's, uh, the, these are the, the linked cases and these are the, the unlinked cases. Uh, green being, uh, being, being uh, GNF work permits. So, so the yellow ones are the Singaporeans and permanent residents. So, but the main point is there's been a little blip up. Uh, I think it's a blip we can definitely tolerate, uh, but, but where it takes, where, where it goes is, uh, is, is the question and we'll have more answers to that over the next uh, weeks and months. Uh, and the final slide again, this is where we sit in Singapore at the moment. There's, uh, there's uh, um, one, one, lost my mouse. Anyway, there's, there's one case in ICU. Uh, there's 214 in general wards across the country. Uh, so that's, that's been fairly flat. Uh, in in-care facilities, uh, all, all the uh, isolation uh, facilities that have been built are uh, starting to become underutilized. I think we got to 20,000 beds, bed capacity. So, so that's coming down. Uh, and the total, of, total number of deaths, we haven't had a death for a little while now. So thanks, David, back to you. Great, Dale. Thanks very much. I, I want to remind you to send your questions uh, in the country where you're uh, watching via the Q&A tool at the bottom of your Zoom screen again. 
Um, and it's my uh, honor to uh, have the opportunity to introduce our guest expert tonight, Dr. Cornelia Chi. She is uh, head and senior consultant, Department of Psychological Medicine, National University Hospital, senior consultant and director of Women's Emotional Health Service, and head and clinical senior lecturer, Department of Psychological Medicine, Yong Lu Lin School of Medicine, National University of Singapore. The title of her talk this evening is Mental Health Issues Surrounding COVID-19. Over to you, Cornelia. All right. Hello, everybody. Everybody, Thank you so much for tuning in today. I practice psychiatry at the National University Hospital for the last 20 years. So I was here when SARS, H1N1, and MERS hit Singapore. I remember it was a really dark time because, as you know, um, many of those who were affected were healthcare workers. And we actually had some, um, some of our best and our brightest uh, pass away due to SARS. So morale was really low and I think our mental health was really affected. We learned a lot from that and the other virus outbreaks over the years, but it's clear that they haven't completely prepared us for this virus. Um, while we've learned a lot about its uh, physical effects on the human body, we are only just beginning to see how it affects the mental health of us as individuals and as species. But there's so much to mental health during this pandemic that can, I can only skim the surface. So I've decided to uh, divide my talk into four different sections. Uh, first, the direct effects of COVID-19, uh, our population response to disasters, what we can do as a population and personal mental health strategies. Okay. So of course there are direct effects from health anxiety for oneself and for others. And when we, it was becoming clear that, uh, that this virus was spreading uh, among the population, we were asked to reduce the number of cases so that uh, we would have fewer uh, patients coming to the, the hospital. And we needn't have, have really worried about that because we had a lot of uh, psychiatric patients who, who, were, who were deathly scared of coming to the hospital. Also, the, if you recall, there are a lot of fear of unknown aspects of how the virus spread and what its characteristics were. And I think there was a lot more of that at the beginning. Um, although even now, I think that it's still controversial whether or not the virus might be spread um, um, via an airborne route. So there's still quite a lot of things that we are, we're still learning. Then we had the effect from the lockdown or circuit breaker measures as they were called in Singapore and indirectly, and this is one, uh, one of the things that's going to be um, uh, having a great impact on us is the financial and economic implications of uh, unemployment, uh, difficulty uh, with, with one's uh, business or maintaining one's home. Okay, and then in what happened in Singapore is that um, sc Singapore schools shifted to full home-based learning for two months. Uh, well, yes, for two months. Uh, first, it was uh, home-based learning, and then they went into school holidays. So suddenly, parents of young children had to uh, cope with their, their kids being at home. And since some of them were also working from home, they had to juggle uh, both their kids' homework and supervising them, as well as doing uh, that own, are trying to do their work. So I still remember I had a patient come in and the first thing she did the moment she came in was to burst into tears. She said she was awful. She had three kids under, under nine and it was you know, crawling all over her when I mean, she was trying to do her work and she was, she was just in tears. Okay, so there are a lot of things that happens when, when we're trying to do things at home and when we have a lot of distractions and there's no, no boundaries at all, really. Okay, next I want to shift gears a little bit and talk about um, direct early effects on, on people who actually get COVID-19. Well, the majority may well be asymptomatic, but we do know now that there's uh, a phenomenon called silent hy hypoxia where patients can have very low oxygen saturation levels without too much discomfort. And um, for these patients, um, because they're in a, a constant hypoxic state, they could be having um, direct effects of that on their brains and, and therefore presenting with confusion or odd behavior. So maybe that's something we need to look at. Also, um, what uh, some of the studies are coming up with is that there appears to be anosmia or um, the inability to smell in a majority of patients. 
And this is something that I think we've got to look out for because it's one of those underrated disabilities or problems that, that patients may have, which we, we don't give as much credit to uh, compared to say someone with uh, blindness or uh, hearing impairment. More on that later. So it started became, becoming quite clear um, that uh, neurologic features were, were part of um, the, the picture when you had a severe infection. So for patients who were uh, in the, uh, the hospital due to ARDS, uh, a large proportion of them had agitation, some more had confusion, and at post-discharge, about a third were still affected. Also, um, after the, the results of the recent trial that showed that dexamethasone might be helpful for severe uh, infections, we do know that steroids are associated with a variety of psychiatric in presentations. We see insomnia, elation, depression, and once in a while, frank psychosis. So that's another thing that we will be looking out for, see, for these patients. In terms of late effects, um, I'd like to make a comparison with uh, SARS and MERS because these are the most uh, uh, recent coronaviral attacks uh, that we've had. So a study by Rogers that came out in May this year showed that during the acute phase of the illness, ab about a third had confusion, depression, anxiety, and about four in 10 with insomnia. And after infection, about three years later, about 15 to 15% had depressed mood or anxiety, about a third had traumatic memories. But the good news was that, you know, maybe about 77% were back at work after three years. So there is some lingering uh, morbidity, but some ability to get back to, to a level of function. Okay, in terms of direct in involvement of the brain, um, this, is, this is something that is uh, becoming pretty obvious. A very recent uh, study has uh, shown that there's a definite neuronal damage in severe and post-mortem cases of COVID-19. And that is something that we really need to look out for. So perhaps what we do need to do is to follow up with uh, known COVID-19 sufferers over the long term, especially those who had ARDS or went into ICU, to make sure that they are not having long-term um, effects. More on the anosmia I was talking about, about 50% of patients, uh, even if they are having very mild symptoms, may have anosmia. They may not actually notice it, but on a sniff test, um, actually, most of them will have uh, complete anosmia or uh, a reduced ability to smell food. And if this is long lasting, then this is really going to impact um, their ability to, to enjoy one's food. And that's something that uh, you do three times a day or so, sometimes more. Um, so that would really impact one's quality of life. Okay, so in terms of very late effects, uh, it's likely that we need to look out for late neuropsychiatric syndromes and Another thing which kind of made me think about is that in psychiatry, where we know that schizophrenia is associated with um, viral illness, ex uh, viral uh, exposure in utero. And this was a, an early article in 1988 that showed that in a Finnish birth cohort, we had uh, a, a higher rate of uh, individuals developing schizophrenia during the 1957 A2, uh, type A2 influenza epidemic. So I'm not saying that this is definitely going to happen, but this is uh, for sure something that we need to watch out for, especially given that uh, the, the number of patients um, getting COVID-19 is so high across the world. Okay, now a little bit about uh, healthcare workers. So based on our experience in Singapore with previous uh, uh, viral um, um, ep epidemics, we are much better prepared this time. So uh, this is a, a, a study that was done by Benjamin Tan et al. in Singapore, surveyed early during the pandemic, and uh, it showed that there was about 8% with depression, 11% anxiety, and about 6% PTS symptoms. And this compares well with 
21% morbidity uh, for those uh, healthcare workers who were surveyed during SARS and the PTS symptoms uh, which were higher. Okay, what was interesting about this current paper is that if you were medical, which they defined as either a doctor or a nurse, then your chances of having anxiety is actually half that than compared if you were non-medical. So executives or perhaps the, the cleaning staff or allied health. So this is an interesting finding that so we really should look um, into, into this and um, just bear in mind that perhaps uh, even though we may, they may be frontline, um, there might be other reasons for this increased anxiety. Okay, what do we know? We know that uh, the health, mental health of healthcare workers is much, much worse when healthcare systems are overwhelmed. And especially when they have to make distressing ethical choices, such as do we um, admit a 40 year old or the 70 year old to our last bed in ICU? And what if that 40 year old is a drug addict versus if the 70 year old is a recently retired eminent professor of economics, let's say. So, you know, uh, going back to philosophy and the trolley bus uh, um, problem it, that there are just so many combinations and it's really difficult um, to have to make these, these life and death decisions. Okay, so for healthcare staff to, had to had to do this in Italy during the height of their pandemic, you can see that the PTS symptoms were so much higher, so, mu so many more um, post-traumatic symptoms and a higher rate of depressed mood and anxiety. Now, going on to migrant workers, so we have 323,000 uh, migrant workers who are housed in dormitories. Um, so it's almost as if they're like a lower middle income country housed within a high income country. Uh, for the most part, they live apart and uh, socialize apart. And um, of course, with the, with the increase in numbers um, that exploded in Singapore, uh, they have had to be housed in, in CCFs and, and special dormitories um, to try and contain uh, the virus. So how is it different for them? Uh, of course, they have to fear losing their jobs, being deported, having language barriers, um, being separated from their family, in some cases overcrowding. And with the misinformation, some of them actually very early on even thought that they were going to be um, shepherded onto a ship to be killed. So the thing to, to note that is that um, a lot of these uh, um, studies actually uh, may have been in some ways a convenient sampling or particularly um, uh, special groups that, that might have been uh, easier to sample. And they may not be representative of um, the poor and marginalized groups, especially. So uh, groups that may not have access to social media or the internet or are stuck at home. And we also have to think of social and economic health as being very closely related to mental health. So for those who are abused, the poor, and those with special needs, I think we do need to really look out for them. Next, in terms of the population response to disasters, this is a, a, a very well-known chart that shows that uh, when there is an impact due to a disaster, at first there is a heroic response and there is a honeymoon where there's a lot of community cohesion. But what is clear is that inevitably there is a period of disillusionment, especially if there are trigger events. And this can happen for, for quite a while. So after an, a single event, such as a, a flood, let's say or an earthquake, uh, the disillusionment phase can come in months after and last for up to a year. And then after the anniversary, some reconstruction occurs. However, what happens is that with, with this virus, we are seeing repeated waves. Um, so what we are going to see probably is a prolonged disaster, not a single event and it's going to have a very long mental health tail. Okay, this is a, a little bit of a switch. Um, and this is, uh, it's been very interesting really, um, just noticing how, how on, on one hand, um, people get together 
and they really pull through. But at the same time, there's a lot of tribalism that it's constantly uh, rearing its ugly head. And I think this is, um, for me as a psychiatrist, not surprising at all. It's no, it's no coincidence that as children, we are brought up uh, learning about good versus bad and, and, uh, and that uh, there's always a black versus a white, an evil stepmother and a, a good princess. And that's because we think in terms of black and white. Um, it's also well um, ingrained in the human psyche to think in terms of tribes. So um, as an in-group, it promotes bonding and it helps uh, us to uh, perform better with our in-group and to, you know, sort of uh, be a bit suspicious of, of potentially hostile out-groups. And when that happens, then it's very easy, especially when we're stressed, to move in this tribalism mode. It's really important though to bear in mind that oftentimes when tribalism is rearing its head, uh, it's our limbic system or our emotional brains that are coming in rather than a more rational neocortex. So if you find yourself thinking very clearly that this, I, am, I am right and you are wrong, then try and put it, push it through your neocortex. Okay, we'll go on to mental health strategies for the population. <clears throat> so this is Abraham Maslow's hierarchy of needs. <clears throat> it's very familiar to lots of people. Basically, it's a, it's a pyramid where starting from the bottom, you look at physiological needs such as food, water, shelter, and sleep. And then you move up uh, along the, need, the, the, the levels of needs. And finally, you become self-actualized. I just want to concentrate on the bottom three, physiological needs. They're unique because we have to keep returning to them, um, followed by safety and security needs and then love and belonging. Okay, so very importantly, one must meet basic needs. And I would include maybe the internet in this, in terms of physiological needs almost. All right. So what happened is um, on uh, February 7th, we all know that in Singapore, Doscon Orange was declared and then suddenly everybody kind of uh, rushed to the supermarkets and started hoarding on things uh, such as daily necessities and toilet paper. Uh, and this is really um, the panic that the basic needs were not going to be met. Yeah, So much so that two days later, uh, our, our Prime Minister actually had to come and reassure the population that uh, there was really no need to worry about the basic needs. And I think this was a very good step, uh, recognizing that there were these needs that really need to be reassured. So. In terms of tribalism, it's often about fight or flight. But in terms of what else we can do as a population, the other coping that we can do is to tend and befriend. And I'm so glad to see that in, in, um, nationally, um, a national care hotline has been set up such that if you're worried or stressed during this time, you can actually call for help. In the NUHS, we also have hotlines and support groups for our healthcare workers and as well as um, uh, for, for staff. I'd just like to bring a, a, a little bit of a detour to uh, this little town called Rosetto and the Rosetto effect. So what happened is in the 1960s, it was noticed that this little Italian town or Italian American town rather, had much lower cardiovascular mortality rates compared to the nearby towns. And they realized that actually there was a very high social cohesion. They shared festivals and had a lot of informal networks. Doors were often open, the houses were closely spaced and neighbors would often pop over to each other and share food and gossip. So what happened is that they were followed up over 50 years. And as the population became more Americanized, as I said, uh, social cohesion went down and mortality rates started approaching those of the rest of the neighboring towns. So, I mean, it's not just about um, physical health, but I think in terms of the mental health of the, 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 the town, it also um, sort of went along the same way. <clears throat> so this is what um, NUHS has been doing for, for the migrant workers, looking after their basic needs as well as their 
uh, social, uh, social needs as well and connecting with them and giving them information. Um, largely though, in the dorms, uh, this, this has been taken up by the NGOs. Um, so for example, HealthServe has got a tele-befriending service where uh, volunteers who can speak the local language of the migrant workers uh, will we'll speak to, the, we'll speak to the, the patients, but at the same time getting supervision from volunteer psychiatrists. So this is a paper on recommendations for improving the mental health of healthcare workers. It's, it's really not rocket science. Clear communication is important, adequate PPE. So this was not, not uh, provided in some countries. Luckily, Singapore was not one of them. Um, adequate rest and practical and psychological support. Okay, finally, into the mental health strategies. These are the things that we are prone to. Misinformation, unpredictability, social isolation, and a lack of control. So in terms of uh, misinformation, obviously, we should have accurate information. And I would just say, why not go for the Goldilocks effect? Basically, uh, if you want your information, make sure it is not too little, not too much, not too hot, and not too cold. Okay, next for mindfulness. What is mindfulness meditation? Um, it can be defined as the, um, the focused awareness on the present in a non-judgmental way. And uh, if you remember this dramatic uh, Thai boys who were stuck in a, a cave in 2018 with their soccer coach for, I think it was for 18 days before they were all rescued. And uh, I think part of the reason why they, we, they actually managed to survive was really because their coach taught them how to meditate. And therefore they stayed calm, they used up less oxygen and they were not panicking or, or um, you know, uh, just, just losing it. So this is a very important thing, I think. When we are facing situations where things are very uncertain and we can't really control things, I mean, what else can you do? Focus on the present. So this reminds me, oh yes, uh, so there, there is actually increasing evidence base for this, um, um, being able to actually change our brains. This reminds me of a birthday card I got some time ago. Uh, forget about the past, you, is, you can't change it. Forget about the future, it's not here yet. Forget about the present, I didn't get you one. But seriously, uh, this is what I tell my patients. Uh, if you have a very active brain that's really overthinking and worrying too much about the, the future all the time, then you're prone to anxiety. Likewise, if you're, you're thinking too much about the past and really preoccupied all the time, then you're going to be more likely to develop depression. And this is where mindfulness comes in because now you can, there's a tool for you to focus more on the present and change your neuronal networks to not overthink either into the future nor the past. Finally, oh, not finally, third thing, social isolation. So finding new ways to connect. Um, this is an interesting paper that I found where uh, they studied uh, the different regions in Italy and they found that um, the regions which had the highest spread of COVID-19 also had the, the smallest household size and uh, a higher number of nursing homes. So in fact, social connectedness was not a risk factor for spreading COVID-19. In fact, it was the opposite. Okay, loss of control. So you generally for high functioning adults, um, we're used to a high level of control. And now in this pandemic often feels that we can't control many things. So the best thing to do then is to focus on what you can control. And in self-determination theory, I found this uh, good. Uh, when you're choosing things that you can control, uh, think of things that you feel competent in, that you can feel that you have some freedom in and which helps you feel related. Having said that, um, if you're introverted, then chances are you'll be happier with, with uh, hobbies that don't require so much relatedness. So actually there are a lot of things that can be done and uh, it's up to you to pick and choose something that actually makes you happy. My other advice also would be to have as, as many tools in your toolbox as you can. If you only rely on exercise, for example, and you're not allowed to exercise or you develop an injury and you have nothing else to fall back on, then it becomes a problem. So develop more skills, more hobbies and more ways of coping. 
Finally, um, I think that there's another thing we can do and that is to choose gratitude. So focusing on the things that we can be grateful for and there's, there's more evidence coming in now that it actually changes our brains as well. So looking at the silver linings, I think it's been very helpful. My patients teach me a lot. And um, actually I was quite surprised when quite a few of my patients didn't actually feel that COVID-19 was a big deal. They said, well, I'm at home now and uh, uh, I've always liked to be at home and now I'm actually normal. Um, and others were saying, you know, uh, I can spend more time with my family or I can actually focus on the important things in life. And that ends my talk. Thank you very much. Thank you, Cornelia. We very much appreciate that. Time is short. Uh, we do want you to send in your questions. We're going to try to get to as many as we can. Um, let me start off with the question from Tan Lee Hoon who states that uh, lockdown measures have seen mothers having to juggle work from home and organizing their children's schooling from home. What words of advice do you have for us? Yes, uh, I think we need to involve fathers more. There was a recent study that came out from um, the Center for Family and Population Research in NUS that showed that working mothers spend twice as much time than uh, compared to fathers on weekdays. So, you know, I think uh, men can step up more. Excellent. And there's a follow-up question. Um, do not, I mean, don't children benefit from having a loving parent at home with them during these trying times? There's a lot of stress. And it's better than them being in a place where maybe people are a bit more impersonal. Uh, such as where? School. Oh, well, yeah, but you know, uh, school is an important place to socialize as well, especially for teens. Ah. Yeah. Okay. Um, Kenneth Liu uh, asks, what's your professional opinion as to the ministerial uh, task force decision to classify psychological services as non-essential during the circuit breaker period? Oh, I got phone calls from my psychologist friends in private practice uh, the, the night it happened. They said, what? We're non-essential? <laughs> oh, I had so many patients who were not doing well because they could not see their, their counselors and their mental health uh, practitioners in private. I think that was a misstep, honestly. Okay. I, I assume the, the, organization, the professional organizations in Singapore are able to... Uh, convey that message? Oh, to... vociferously. And that's why that, that was eventually, you know, reversed. Yeah. Well done. Um, how do we individualize the message regarding the availability of mental health screening and mental health care uh, to be more acceptable in light of the cultural, religious, and or ethnic uh, group differences in how mental health issues are perceived? This is going to be a tough one. It has to be a whole of society thing. And, you know, I was just chatting with my, fr my, my, my patient today. Um, and she was saying that, uh, can I get insurance uh, if, I, if, I, um, if I apply for it now? Because I was, I was denied it when I, when I was hospitalized three years ago. And I said, you know, honestly, our local insurers are not really very enlightened. And um, that, that is a tragedy. It, it's it's got to be not just, not just mental health uh, advocates. Um, I think we're just going to keep on pushing the envelope. So what is, the, what is the baseline rate of mental health issues in Singapore? I know in the United States, it's around 17 to 20%. Mm. Uh, and I know after, after Katrina, it went up to 55%, uh, the, yeah. the hurricane. So what is our baseline rate? Baseline rate, according to our Singa Singapore mental health um, study that was done a few years ago, uh, would put depression, anxiety, if I'm not wrong, at around 5%. But that's not lifetime um, uh, prevalence. That was quite prevalent. Okay. Yeah. Um, how would you compare the efficacy of face-to-face -face delivery of mental health, uh, mental health care versus virtual delivery? Well, there are pros and cons both ways. If, you, if, if it's compared with no mental health delivery, then it's definitely ideal. But there are problems with uh, uh, mental health delivery via, you know, teleconsult or video consult. I think some of the nuances don't quite come across, and uh, certainly if the patient might be at risk for self harm or suicide, then that could be a problem. So we always have to make sure that the patient is uh, likely to be safe before we start the consult. Okay. 
Um, most countries do not have adequate mental health personnel to meet everyone's needs. And as such, the primary caregivers are often providing screening and mental health care. Do you have a few simple tips, uh, tips for primary care uh, providers who may be in a polyclinic with only five to 15 minutes with each patient? Uh, 15 minutes is, is asking a lot. Yeah. I think <laughs> um, that's a tough one. I, I think um, sometimes it's about relationship and it's just uh, showing that you care as a person and you're listening. Actually, not, not enough people listen. So if you're able to listen, um, I think that was a, that's a great help already. Um, we're doing more uh, telecommuting uh, and uh, incorporating that into our lives. Is, is there a looming crisis from social media reliance? You mentioned earlier that, that one of the basic necessities is the internet, but does the reliance on social media uh, cause us to have disintegration in socialization? Well, I think this is a complex one. Uh, human beings are, are generally meant to be social. And I think that the early studies generally showed that if you spend more time on social media, then it was correlated with um, uh, more mental health problems. I think it's, it's actually much more complex with, than that. Um, I think for some people, it can be a real lifeline. And I think society is evolving to, to socialize and to reach out and to find very positive things um, using social media. Um. Yifeng has asked, uh, what are the top three silver linings you see arising from COVID-19 uh, for the mental health care sector, if you can? <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> um, firstly, the, um, the chance to simplify one's life. So I used to travel very often and when I couldn't do that anymore, um, I had to find books and then now I'm happily traveling to, you know, uh, 18th century Russia or, or Japan uh, in my mind. <laughs> That's one. So simplifying. I think the other thing is to get back to nature. One of the things I really, really enjoyed about the last day of the circuit breaker was how blue the skies were. Um, so I think getting back to nature is another one. And the last one is, I think, con if you can, connecting with the people in your house. Um, I've got two teenage girls. And um, we taught them, my, my husband and I taught them uh, mahjong, and we had many happy evenings playing mahjong. Nice. Yeah. Uh, Joyce uh, Tio has asked, uh, Dr. Chi, what uh, stage of the disaster response chart is Singapore at now? What can we expect uh, in the delusionment stage? Oh, so that chart is for a single event. Um, so what we're really doing is uh, very uncharted, really. And I think the disillusionment is just going to go up uh, and down with time, and it's going to be dragged out quite a bit. Mm. Okay. And just last question is, looking back on the last six months, if you could have two wishes for mental health services or support in Singapore, what, what would you have in place now that maybe we don't? Um, I think maybe more, uh, more of a setup for, for televisits or, or teleconsulting. And uh, the other thing would be just uh, hmm, less stigma. Yeah. Thank you so much. We're going to, we're time is short. Over to you, Dale. <laughs> Oh, that was quick. <laughs> <laughs> Just um, jump right in. <laughs> okay, so it's a slightly truncated uh, version tonight, David, because I, I we predicted that we might uh, might run out of time. So I've just got uh, got a couple tonight. Uh, the first one, the and Cornelia actually mentioned it. There's this whole uh, business about is it airborne, uh, and and I've got. Uh, a little story about drones in South Korea after that. So, so uh, I think you'll all remember this picture. This was in, in the outbreak movie when Dustin Hoffman looked up at, a, at, a, at an air vent and said, it's gone airborne. And, and I, I think it's a, a hallmark uh, moment in the movie. And, uh, and I, I think that's what a lot of people think about. But it's obviously a lot more complicated than that. When... Um, so when we, uh, 
uh, are considering whether something's airborne, it, it comes down to the, uh, the, the size of the particle. But, uh, as a rule of thumb, if it's, if it's under five microns in size, that's uh, five thousandths of a millimeter, um, then it's capable of being suspended in air. But, but bigger ones, bi bigger um, particles tend to be droplets that fall to the ground. And that's where the, the one to two meters comes from. Um, and it, it relates to the precautions we take um, when we say one to two meters, when we say uh, surgical mask is, is adequate um, most of the time, then, then this is uh, really the, the presumption. So, so it is quite important to understand whether it is airborne or not. So as I think uh, most people would know, there was a, an article published in CID during the week and a, and a letter also to the New York Times by the, the same authors uh, claiming 239 people had, uh, had uh, uh, were wanting to put pressure on WHO to admit that it was, uh, that it was airborne. So let, let me just uh, take, take you through that. Um, the, uh, the, the people that wrote the letter, there, there were a few epidemiologists and public health people, but, but by and large, they were the, their ventilation experts, their aero engineers. Uh, they work in laboratories and, and look at uh, airflow and, and droplets and, and uh, suspended particles in the air and things like that. <laughs> So we're trying to work out if these particles uh, uh, can, can spread long distances. So you can see in this little graphic that obviously uh, with general air movement, if it was suspended in the air, that it could go really tens of meters. So, so there in how do you prove it? Uh, and you can do this two ways. You can do this by uh, epidemiologically, and you can also do it uh, uh, virologically. Now, let's let's start with the epidemiologic side. So we know that the vast majority of people that get COVID get it from close contact, uh, and the and the reproductive number is generally around two point five. Now, measles and chickenpox are, are the, the the two famous viruses for uh, for being airborne. Their, their reproductive number is, you know, 10, 12, 15. And that's because it's airborne. It can go long distances and people can get the disease without having any close contact with someone with the disease. So already that reproductive number is starting to give us some hints that, that it's, uh, it's mostly droplet spread. Now, uh, are, there, are there any examples of people that have got the disease with no contact? Now, that's possible. There's, there's some publications of, of restaurants and singing events where, where so many people got it, indeed even super spreading events, where you might argue that it, it must be airborne because it was a super spreader event and so many, so many uh, people got the disease. Um, and maybe singing does have the capacity to, to create these very small aerosols. But unfortunately, you can't remove the, the concept of, of, of fomites being contaminated. So this is the environment. So this is where we say when we're, when we're deciding it on, trans, on transmission-based precautions, is it contact, is it droplet, is it airborne? And we, we generally go with the theory that it's contact and droplet. Therefore, wash your hands, keep your distance, wear a mask, uh, particularly if you can't keep that distance. So um, did some of these super spreading events, uh, restaurants uh, and singing events, did they have uh, environmental contamination? And that's how the transmission happened. And that we can't be 100% sure of. But this is one of the pieces of evidence cited by the, the, the airborne uh, protagonists. Um, so, so that would be, be the first thing. Now, now we know it's never been cultured from a, a, an aerosol, okay? They've found PCR positive, but it's never been cultured as opposed to other viruses, which you can uh, culture from the aerosols. So therefore, is it just fragments of the virus in, in, the, uh, in the aerosol? We know that when we swab throats, 
towards the, the, the end of the illness that we can't culture it, but we can detect um, that the PCR can be positive and we can detect, uh, we can detect uh, viral RNA. So um, that's an important point to know that it's actually never been cultured uh, despite a lot of efforts. Having said that, it's not easy to culture uh, aerosols. So, uh, so, so that again is not a definite, no, it can't be uh, aerosol uh, spread. <clears throat> So, um, so the, the, the WHO has basically always said that we believe that it's mostly contact and, and droplet spread. We won't exclude that it could be um, aerosol spread. Um, <clears throat> but with that R naught and with that epidemiology and with the fact that we can't culture it, or at least can't culture it easily, then, then at best, I would argue that that airborne precaution is is unlikely or is is a, a lower driver of the outbreak. We know there's aerosol generating procedures, so if you're having a tube put down your throat or dental work or something like that, then that can generate aerosols. Um, but outside of the hospital, we we really don't don't see it as a, a as a big driver, although that what that's what all the fuss is about. Uh, with with a, a school of thought being that it is a big driver, it's definitely the argument's definitely not over yet, but but that's where we stand, and I, I hope that explanation helps people out there. Um, I just wanted to uh, to go to to a, uh, a a video now. So so this is a a very neat video that uh, that I came across during the week. Um, it's uh, it's in South Korea. Uh, these are drones uh, choreographed uh, amazingly. The the actual video is a little bit longer, so thank you, Joe, for editing it to to to, to just capture the the key bits. Um, but uh, I'll, uh, I'll I'll hand over to you now, Joe, to show the video, please. Some things just make you speechless, right? <laughs> that is um, awesome. <laughs> yeah. Um, anyway, the whole video takes 11 minutes. Um, the way they move through all the, uh, the the virus on the front of the masks and the the uh, social distancing, moving the two heads away and the hand washing and then the thanks to healthcare workers. Uh, apparently, no one in Seoul knew that was happening. They just, uh, they just did it. So... Uh, Anyway, uh, I don't know. I've, I've turned into the video guy. We've, uh, that's three in a row. It wasn't supposed to be it, but uh, I don't know what's going to happen from one week to the next. But uh, anyway.
Back to you, David. Thanks. All right. Thank you very much, Dale. That, that's superb. Yeah. Uh, let me just uh, provide a, a brief summary of tonight, uh, the key points. Uh, we learned that there'll be a long mental health tail as consequences of uh, COVID-19 due to the biologic effects of the, viruses, uh, the virus and the drugs used to treat it, uh, as well as social isol uh, isolation and the economic impact this is having on us. Um, there should be more discussion and action to alleviate the disproportionate responsibilities that working mothers are experiencing compared to the working fathers during this pandemic. We learned that. Um, and finally, foreign workers and healthcare workers are vulnerable. To allay fear, we should provide clear routine, repeated messaging, uh, which is uh, critical to their mental well being, adequate supplies, whether it's PPE, food, et cetera, adequate rest, uh, and teaching, encouraging mindfulness and self determination. Uh, it leaves me now to thank our two speakers, Dale, as usual, an excellent job, and Cornelia, we're so glad that you joined us tonight. Uh, our speaker next week will be Professor David Patterson. He's Director of University of Queensland, the Center for Clinical Research and Consultant Infectious Diseases Physician at the Royal Brisbane and Women's Hospital. The title of his talk will be Treating COVID-19, Reckless Cowboys versus the Ivory Tower Academics. Sounds like it'll be entertaining. There's a chat box tool at the bottom of your screen. We'd appreciate your feedback. The chat box will be open for another 10 minutes or so. We welcome your comments and your contribution to the Mystery Pandemic Song of the Week. Until next week, stay safe, wash your hands, and send us your suggested Pandemic Song of the Week. And after months of staying home with your family, I'm sure you'll all smile when you hear the lyrics to Paul Thorne's 2010 song, I Don't Like Half the Folks I Love. Good night. <laughs>